Good morning and happy Friday. It's been an amazing week filled with lots of great sessions, catching up with old friends and meeting many new ones. Last night was such a blast at karaoke, hence my hoarseness this morning. Um, and I want to just express on behalf of the conference a sincere gratitude to everyone who made this week very, very memorable. Today's our final day of the conference, and we have a, another full day of sessions ahead. The exhibit hall will be open this morning, but it will be closing a little bit earlier uh, this afternoon at 1.30, so make sure to do your final rounds. This morning, we have our final featured presentation. Uh, the uh, presentation is Disability Through a Whole New Lens, Reframing Disability in Media with Danny Woodburn and Terry Hartman Squire. Thank you to you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can you all hear? This looks like a comedy club because everybody <laughs> doesn't want to be up front. I think that was the. That's all. We'll take hecklers. It's fine. <laughs> Are we up? We're up. Great. Oh, sorry. There we go. Are we loud? Where, are we live, right? Yeah, we're live. We're live? Yeah. Live from New York. No, <laughs> we're live from Anaheim. It's CSUN. Boy, this is a tough crowd, Danny. All right. Yeah, I know. So. Oh, you got the laugh. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> you got the credits. I got the laugh. Where, thank you, CSUN, for the health protocols. And these are lip readable uh, PPE masks. So that's excellent. It's accessible. So, First of all, we want to thank Sandy and her team, Sean, Julia, Andrew, and all the CSUN folks that are here today to make this possible. Um, and I would like to personally thank my mentor, Harry Murphy, who got us all in this mess 37 years ago in starting the first CSUN conference. Um, I learned a lot at CSUN and from Harry. Um, you never know that from my grade point average, but it's, it's a fabulous conference. It's always been an incubator of innovation and ideas. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce my partner in crime, Danny Woodburn. Uh, there we go. Danny, you may recognize him from Seinfeld and The Watchmen. And if you watched Station 19 last week, Danny crushed it, or more accurately, a chandelier crushed him, but it was one of his really great performances of 150 television appearances and 30 films to date, and renowned for his work in disability activism. And for the last 25 years, he's been working with studios and advocacy groups and media and foundations and universities, and most of the disability movement in film and television is because of this guy. And this is my partner, Terry Hartman Squire, whom I don't know how long I have known for some reason. We have no idea when we first met in this, in this world of disability advocacy. Uh, but Terry is a CEO of her company, Einsoft Communications, which is an award-winning disability inclusive diversity production, employment, and strategic marketing firm, founded Media Access Office and Lights Camera Access to increase disability employment and improved portrayals consulted on hundreds of TV films, advertising, marketing campaigns, and focus groups. So, this is a, a much more impressive resume, as far as I can, can tell, than uh, my own. No, not really. And together, we've created ADA Lead On Productions to recognize history, impact, and purpose of the ADA through celebration and productions with employment of diverse disabled artists, innovators, advocates, and allies. So, you being here at CSUN makes you one of the disability savvy companies here. You all have set the industry standard, bless you, on accessible and usable products and services. Um, you practice disability inclusive strategies, including disability employee resource groups, affinity groups, or business networking groups. Um, you've all built strategic alliances with national disability organizations. And your self-ID campaigns are more effective because some of your senior executives have disclosed your disability. So you've done the right thing, you've done the heavy lifting internally, and now it's time to market yourselves to this brand loyal disability market of $490 billion, 
including friends and allies and other multiply marginalized communities. That includes potential employees, customers, and shareholders. And we guarantee that none of that $490 billion is being used to buy an ego space rocket. Right, <laughs> that's true. Hey, you got a laugh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we're working. only six minutes into this. <laughs> we got 54 minutes, so warm up your laughter. So, um, so one good example is the National Organization on Disability. They have an employment tracker. Now the best part of this is it gives you a baseline. It's free, it's confidential. Today is March 18th, and for those of you at home, you can do this at home. Uh, the employment tracker is a prerequisite for if any of your companies would like to be considered for recognition by Diversity Inc. And NOD has come up with a disability employment maturity curve um, where compliance is the baseline, but then you become more competent, you become more confident, and then through following these strategies, you polish your competitive advantage. And, and we're so, gonna give you a little bit of time to write down that website. Yeah, it's www. <laughs> I guess our definition of a little bit of time is different. <laughs> www.nod.org. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. So now that the company's here, and you've been, some of you have been here presenting for 37 years with, um, with Harry and when it first started, and I believe Alan Brightman was at Apple at the time and just launching Apple Accessibility. It was at the very first conference. Um, you got this. So now it's time to take it on the road and present disability through a whole new lens or you're gonna miss the vote. Okay, so let's go do some overview on what that takes from the expertise you have in accessibility of accessible and usable products and services and how that can translate as your company being an employer of choice and a brand of choice. So starts with web accessibility and everybody in this room, you got it because you're here and you realize that it's an important and most of the world is on a learning curve and the presenters here and the audience here have helped those individual companies to gain that mastery over making sure that accessibility exists in websites from career portals to uh, product lines, et cetera. And we'll be discussing also in this section uh, language and messaging. And we'll review some websites and some company policies that uh, maybe not so great. <laughs> and some that are so great. With the stock photos and their representations up on, that are authentic. Right. And that's the key. So we're going to start with some language and communication and messaging, and then we'll move into the imagery. So uh, people first versus identity first. I know we've all sort of heard these, these terms. Um, People first language is, is very much u utilized by numerous organizations and it's all fine, but certainly within the disability community right now, there's an identity first wave that is happening. Um, and so, uh, and it's subjective. It's subjective to each person is driven by the preference of the individual with the disability. Many organizations, as I said, will default to the people first language, but yet in our community, there is disabled say the word, uh, a phrase that I believe was coined by my friend Lawrence Carter Long. Um, it, it was actually. Yeah. And it was during the first speech, first day of the union by President Obama, where the disability community had been working with the administration and they outlined all the different marginalized groups and in the speech it said, and women and LGBT and intersectionality and veterans and no disability. So Lawrence being an activist, he, um, he just shot out on social media, hashtag, disabled, say the word, woke up the next morning and people are going, tell us about your say the word campaign. And so it's really approves the power of social media. So let's talk about some safe bets. We want to be specific with regard to identity. So these are all safe bets. Uh, wheelchair user, deaf and hard of hearing, blind and low vision, a little person. Now I have dwarf in parentheses because it is a medical diagnosis yet within the dwarf community, the little people community, it, it is used in a sort of an empowerment kind of way. So um, you could use either in, in, in one sense or the other, but I would check with the community at large. Uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities, neurodiverse, ADHD, autistic, autism, 
and non-apparent disabilities. And when in doubt, ask. So Always ask. Big purple sign dropping down with smoke that says. <clears throat> so let's talk about some unsafe bets. Differently abled. You know, you'll hear parents use these terms, or you hear some folks use these terms still in parts of the country. It's not really the best terminology, and people are sort of turned off to it. Afflicted with suffering from, this gets into the medical model of disability, which is, we're moving obviously into the social model, but we regress as people sometimes. Difability, that's one of those cutesy words um, that sort of takes away your identity in a sense and makes the non-disabled community um, comfortable. Impaired, again, that is a, a return to the medical model of disability, handicapped or handicapable. Uh, these are anachronistic, I think, at this point. Um, special and special needs. Uh, when we think about special and special needs, um, we're moving toward this idea that needs are not special, that needs are universal. So we're, that's another area of language that's shifting. Um, and this is one of my favorites. It's this, uh, the Aunt Martha version <laughs> of this is, uh, oh, they're angels on earth. Aren't they just the best people in the world? You want to get to know them and hug them. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's not so great either. Right. Now let's move into offensive words. So uh, I've been prompted to give a little bit of a trigger warning here. <laughs> For me, a trigger warning is somebody prompting me that there's a trigger warning. <laughs> uh, retard, retarded, <laughs> stupid, moron. And it just, at least pain me to say, actually, uh, yeah. some of these. Um, words used to describe developmental disability. So, for, for me, this is my, my model is any word that has been used to eliminate or reduce a person's humanity falls into the, and this is, a, a, I think, an across the board kind of idea, that falls into what I would deem offensive. Uh, for the mental health community, crazy nuts, mental lunatic, nut job, uh, deaf mute, not a thing. You've heard these, uh, I've heard these, this term bandied about in television shows. It's just, it's not a thing. Um, wheelchair bound or confined. Uh, unless someone is on house arrest and strapped to it, I don't think that is a thing either. Um, crippled, lame, spastic, gimp. Uh, we, you know, as we explore some of these things in language, um, what it might be offensive here is not as offensive in other countries. So uh, certain things I've, I've discovered haven't been said or have been said more often in other places, and it's like, well, that's offensive here. So, you know, we have to... We have to sort of adjust and, and understand what is offensive in, the, in other parts of the world and what is not. And that's an area of exploration that Terry and I are going to continue to uh, look into. And then my personal favorite, <laughs> which I won't even say, um, but moving on. Uh, getting into, for the studio audience. Getting into company <laughs> websites. Um, here's an example of something I found interesting. Uh, QVC, which is parent company Curate. Everybody's heard of QVC. They have a website policy that reads 25% of leaders, uh, this is you know, for their future, uh, increase diverse representation in our supervisory and leadership roles. 25% of leaders to be members of underrepresented racial ethnic groups by 2025. Double percent of black and Hispanic Latinx leaders to 12 and a half and 10% respectively by 2025. Achieve gender parity, 50% women, at the director level worldwide by 2023. So what's missing? So when we don't talk about inclusion policies and diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, departments, divisions, what have you, we must always remember that disability needs to be included in those policies. So moving in further into the website, the big message here is be authentic. Bring fun, energy, make an impact. However, in looking at some of their stock photos, Here's a lovely young woman on their moving forward page, our path forward, right? So there's really been not much discussion of, or if any, of uh, disability yet. Here is this photo of this young woman um, who, I don't know, looks to me like she's got the legs of a tennis pro. Uh, <laughs> so let's, let's examine this photo. On this website, you can click and look for models. Like you see the picture and then you go see more from this model. So apparently this day at the office was everybody gets to try the wheelchair. 
Um, <laughs> we see the gentleman in the red flannel in the p p picture in the middle and to the right, he is standing and then sitting at the table. And then we also see the woman who is in the middle in the chair. Now she's over here standing with the other group while, while Chad gets to try out the wheelchair. <laughs> Don't laugh, it really happens way too much. And you go and laugh. This is our third laugh and we're 16 minutes into it. So go ahead. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving into Adobe, Photostock. I've explored some of these sites and have discovered, you know, there's a, here's a little girl in a, in a wheelchair who apparently, I don't, I don't think that wheelchair is not the best size for her. Too big. Uh, so I investigated this young lady as a model and, oh, it's a miracle, <laughs> folks. It's a miracle. She's running and playing with the kids. Wonderful. Um, so we want to make sure that we have authentic representation. If you're going to grab these stock photos from either of these sites, explore the models themselves. So let's look at some authentic representations of disability in these two areas, stock photos from Adobe and from Photostock. Oh, no, I have one more special one. This is, this is one of my favorites. Uh, the, the blind woman with the cane and the guide dog now, the woman is walking, but the guide dog has decided he's not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> my guess is that's not really a guide dog. Uh, and anyway, again, another miracle, folks. Here she is. She's moved into reading her iPhone even without her glasses. She can take them down to read. Oh, look, it's, just, it's another miracle. And the dog is gone, apparently. Uh, so I wanted to talk further about authentic representations. And here we see more authentic, I explored these models. I saw that they each were representing, as was described, uh, uh, Asian blind woman, a young woman in a wheelchair, uh, a boy with hearing aids. Um, so this boy, I assume, has some uh, difficulty hearing because in all of his shots, he's always wearing, he's never without. Right. So that's the assumption I can make, and that, that's thematically what was presented in all of his shots. So that's, those are good representations, as are these. Now, the other thing, too, is um, I had great difficulty finding those uh, multiply marginalized people from uh, other race or ethnic groups being represented with disability. Luckily, we have that in, in today. I found three. I found three folks, that's what it came down to. So it's a, a, a young black woman reclining on a couch with her prosthetic leg and reading, then a young Asian girl with Down syndrome, and then a young woman uh, in a racing stance with her prosthesis. These are all good, authentic representations. So it's important that we have authenticity uh, for us because if you take us out of the equation just ever, just a little tiny bit, we're completely out of the equation. So th those representations are not. You would never look for, do a search for uh, African-American woman and then all of, the, all of the pictures are not of African-American woman. You have, you're not gonna see a white lady there in the African-American woman list. So right. if you're searching for people who are deaf or blind, have some disability, you wanna see them represented authentically. So happily, there is an alternative, and that's thanks to the folks at Verizon Media, which actually started out at Yahoo, and Alan Brightman was one of the first presenters here at, at CSUN with Harry 37 years ago when he was at Apple. He went to Yahoo and brought with him in the transition from Yahoo to Oath to Verizon Media. Uh, Mike Shabonik, who's presented here at this conference a lot from Apple, who's now with Meta. Larry Goldberg, who's presented a lot at this conference, who uh, started out, really launched a descriptive video unit and um, WGBH Accessible Media Center. Gary Moulton, who's presented here at Microsoft. Darren Burton from the American Foundation for the Blind Tech Group, and who have done a lot of user testings with many of the CSUN companies, and Margot Joffe. So this dream team, they wanted to redo their website, and they had the same experience as Danny really not good stuff. So what we decided to do was to work in collaboration with the National Disability Leadership Alliance. And here's where the strategic alliances and authenticity, the rubber really meets the road. We did focus groups with deaf, hard of hearing, blind, low vision, mobility, 
and limited dexterity. And I am sorry for racing through that list to our captioners and sign language interpreters. I get excited about this stuff, apologize. Um, so the focus groups revealed key insights from opinion makers and key influencers and leaders on what constitutes an authentic image and what is not. So the picture of the, I'm using air quotes, blind woman and her guide dog who's taken a break in the middle of an intersection, you would never have a white cane from ability and a dog in the other hand. So all of that rich qualitative data became guidelines for Getty Images and 240,000 photographers that shoot for Getty worldwide, and thus the launch of the disability collection. Now, they didn't stop there. They're encouraging photographers with disabilities with that lived experience, and when you have a lived experience, no matter what it is, you have a different lens on the world. And so we want the lens of a photographer with a disability to be projected on websites, in advertising, on billboards, in television, in whatever's left of print media. Um, those are really important because you all work really hard to make sure that there is accessibility embedded in everything you do, from your corporate culture to your business imperative. And now it's really important to think about pushing that out to the outside world and not using disabled mimicry, as, as our colleague Dominic Evans calls it. So because if you do, frankly, I'm, I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, so the, the video you're gonna see is captioned. However, I wanted to explain, because it moves fast. There's some um, jump cuts between different people with disabilities as we were putting together the campaign. The first person who speaks is Jordan Nicholson, who's a photographer with disabilities who went on to be the photographer for Disability in one of the disability business um, collaboratives. Ace Radcliffe, Leroy Moore, and Zara Chanchu, who is um, with Deaf Film Camp. So if we can roll the video, thanks. The faces you see in your day-to-day -day life ultimately define your perspective on what's normal, what you're frequently seeing is this idea of disabled as lesser, disabled as something that needs to be fixed. I don't need to be fixed from what I am. I just want to be included, and I think that we all do. People with disabilities make up about 20% of the population, but only 2% of our media. Let's change that. Okay, let's go. Verizon, the disability community, and Getty Images are creating a new photo collection that more accurately reflects the lives and diversity of people with disabilities. We can do anything, and it requires the media to help get that message out. Let's change how the world sees disability. <laughs> Thank you. Get started at thedisabilitycollection.com. All right. So when you do it right and when you work with the disability community, NDLA is the 17, quote, owned and operated disability organizations, National Feder Federation of the Blind, American Council of the Blind, National Association of the Deaf, Hearing Loss Association of America, et cetera. So um, do it right and the results will be very much in alignment with your corporate culture and the disability rights community. So um, that effect in going from the video and opening doors to marketing and advertising. So how do you take what you do inside your companies and how important that is, or you wouldn't be here today, or you wouldn't be watching from home. Um, authentic casting, as we've talked about, Danny is the vice chair of the SAG-AFTRA Committee of Performers with Disabilities. There are thousands of actors and models with disabilities, so there are no excuses that you don't know where to find them, and we'll have some resources at the end, so you really will know where to find them, um, in developing messaging from that lived experience, because you want it to be authentic. And just like you're utilizing your disability employee resource groups inside the company for policy and accessible and usable products and services, tap them for 
confirming that the images are authentic and the messaging is accurate. And, and this community definitely will speak out. As we've seen in numerous films and television shows, when there is inauthentic representation, the community does speak out, especially in this era of social media. Right. So it's a path we all want to continue to take. Thanks. And it's good for business. I remember $490 billion there. Okay. So um, let's look at a few, let's not look at them, let's experience a few best practices. Uh, Comcast NBC Universal um, is uh, really a, a, the, one of the front runners in disability inclusion in their programming on the NBC side of the house. Jerry Jewell was the first comedian with a disability to have a recurring role in which show? Anybody watch it? Anybody over 40 in the audience? Facts of Life. <laughs> And of course, Danny Woodburn was on Seinfeld, and even they had smurfing in sign language uh, on the Smurfs. Now that's really hard because Smurfs and all cartoon characters only have four fingers. So it's really hard to sign with four fingers. But they did it. On the Comcast side of the house, Tom Lukowski has presented here at CSUN conference in, in the past and all the great accessibility they're doing with Xfinity. And on the universal side of the house, they have been doing some great disability inclusion, including the first wheelchair accessible dressing room for Les Janky, who was on Tales of Gold Monkey, for those of you that may be over 50 in the crowd. So what they're doing now is they're doing streaming of, um, of authentic representation. Now, that they got together with their disability resource group, My Abilities, and Comcast NBC Universal, and now they are showing um, through this mechanism um, actual authentic casting. What a concept. Sony um, has done some really groundbreaking work on accessibility in the world of gaming with their PlayStation, and they've been collaborating with Able Gamers and other gamers with disabilities um, because we know that that's a, a, one of the preferred modes of entertainment for some people with disabilities. And the next, of course, Apple. Sarah Herlinger and Jeanette have, have presented here at this conference a lot. Um, and we're all rooting for CODA, um, that movie to win the Academy Award in a couple of weeks. So if any of you are Academy members, the voting opened yesterday and it closes on the 22nd. So it's. Let's all root for CODA because a win for one segment of the disability and deaf community is a win for all of us. And this is a, a real shift in the paradigm from when Marley won the Academy Award yes. back in the 80s for Children of a Lesser God because there was a lot of uh, ridicule by the press that she was not as deserving because she actually is deaf. Yeah. And so this is, I, I feel like for her, this is a full circle yeah. sort of get back at that, that old message from 30 years ago and address the fact that A, she was one of the people that, well, she was the person that made this film happen yeah. and, and complete, get it completely authentically cast. It was so important for her and the reward, as you can see, is phenomenal and Apple is very proud of this. Yeah. So, other best practices, um, Amazon Studios. Um, has been doing some excellent work and created an inclusion policy and playbook. And their inclusion policy is the Amazon Studio strives to be the home of top tier talent and content. We work to consistently delight all segments of our audiences. We do it in two ways. First, by seeking out stories that amplify the voices of characters across race, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, age, religion, disability. Bing, bing. Ding, ding. Including mental health, body size, gender, gender identity, and gender expression. Talk about inclusion. Secondly, by bringing these often unrepresented and misrepresented characters to life in an inclusive production environment with the realization that ensuring equity in the future requires correcting inequities of the past. So the goal is to involve storytellers in the stories we tell 
and the people we engage to tell them. So on the air now is as we see it, you know, Jack Harrison and Violet, the three 20 something people with autism as they experience the world. And we know that there's been a migration from what Amazon has done under the leadership of Peter Korn, uh, who's presented many times at this conference, uh, and Josh Mele, congratulations, Josh, on your MacArthur Award. That's very cool. Um, so there is an integration of accessibility into products that are streamed live. So you can find that full policy at uh, dei.amazonstudios.com forward slash inclusion hyphen policy. I think that's a fairly easy website to remember. Yeah. So moving into uh, access to employment, accessible auditions and workspaces, hiring talent with disabilities in front of and behind the camera keyboard. So this is a commitment that, that Amazon has made and is making. Uh, and they want to apply the same attention to disability representation in advertising and marketing as you do when creating accessible and, and usable products and services. Right. And we've seen a couple of different commercials for Alexa that involve people with various disabilities. So this is another really great example of what companies can do to promote, be loud and proud about what you've done in the hard, lifting, hard, hard work and heavy lifting of creating accessibility across so the board. So here's the thing, Hollywood is well over 115 years old, right? So movie making for, for, the, for the world at large is over a century old. The ADA is over 30, and yet is still on sets, on location. The accessibility factor has been an issue. And so these things are going to be changed. So, where do you find the talent? Where do you find it in front of and behind the camera? Um, we've been working with um, Lights Camera Access for about 10 years in creating a career incubator and career exploration uh, summit, which was pre-COVID summit. Post-COVID or during COVID and after COVID, it's online. And it's important for talent to get the skills and the networking involved in, in being involved in the entertainment industry and media industries. Um, there's three objectives of employment in front of and behind the camera, improving portrayals and accessible media. And we work with internships with Meta. There's a diverse production assistant program, Women's Z News and The Late Show with Stephen Colbert are just a few of the internship opportunities that we provide for people with disabilities. Um, the video you're about to see was shot at BBDO by TV Guide. BBDO is one of the world's largest advertising agencies. And it was before COVID in our on-site uh, summit. Um, the people who you will hear from who are speaking in the film are uh, myself. Dale Muhammad is a, a multi-marginalized um, intersectional filmmaker. She and Jim Lebrecht, who were the director of Crip Camp, started Four in One Coalition, so there could be a deeper pipeline of talent in front of and behind, mostly behind the camera and below the line in the technical trades. Elaine Katz, who's the vice president of the Kessler Foundation, Stephen Allen from Policy Works and Peer Mentoring Works, David Zimmerman from Meet the Biz, and the person he's talking to in the video is Johnny Crescendo, and um, uh, Netflix will just finish completing production on that story. It's kind of like comparable to Crip Camp, but it's how Johnny and his then wife, Barbara, started the disability rights movement in the UK. Uh, Tamika uh, Spruce, Storm Smith, and then JD Michaels from BBDO. Today at BBDO, they're hosting Lights Camera Access 2.0, which is a mentoring event for aspiring media professionals with disabilities. I'm here at LCA 2.0 in the capacity as a filmmaker. I'm visually impaired. Uh, I guess blind would be the, the term that a lot of people use. And one of the things that's been really interesting to note is I'm not seeing very many other people with disabilities actually participating in the industry. There's a lot of information out there that really discourages 
producers and others in the media from hiring people with disabilities. Mainly they think they're not capable. Specifically with the media industry, along with other industries, it really is a product of attitudes and perceptions. Acting in, in the industry, this industry is hard in itself for any actor, but especially if you, quote, have a disability. A lot of people think that you can't do anything or, you know, you can't work on set. There is an assumption or a misconception about disability meaning uh, a limitation. And it just means, for me, I just happen to have these other things, but I'm fully functional. Here, what uh, we've been pushing is diversity is your passions and your choices and your experiences, and that's it. Once you start to look that way, you, you start to see a lot more commonality. I'm autistic. I also have at least 10 other disabilities. I found LCA, it was like a godsend. It, the fact that it opened so many doors to me. We hope through the media to show more accurate portrayals of people with disabilities, to hire more people with disabilities, to shatter myths about what people with disabilities can or cannot do, and really for that group to have the power to tell their own stories through their unique lens. What this event does is put together the mentors and the people seeking work, and hopefully we'll have some job matches today. Thanks, Danny. So okay. we're getting into talent resources. Where do we find this talent? Um, ADA Lead Dog Productions, that's the production company that Terry and I have established. We do, uh, as we mentioned, these celebrations of the ADA where we give opportunities to folks. But now our goal is to take all the folks that we've worked with over the last two years of this, what do we call this, the Hamlet of Diseases, um, uh, and, and build the database. And uh, at ADA Lead On Productions, we've won uh, two awards and uh, Investors, collaborators, uh, these are a list of our collaborators. Um, we've done five shows, we're, we're four shows so far, working on our fifth. And this uh, talent stream, we want to be searchable. Right. Um, sorry, I went too far. We want this talent stream to be searchable, uh, which we will get into later. So right, but before we do the film, we just want to say these are two productions, it's a scissor reel that we put together for what we, the two productions we did in 2021. The first one is Black Future Month, and uh, the first speaker is Sandra Evers Manley from the Hollywood Black Education and Resource Center. The other speakers are identified by the audio describer and through the captioning at Chiron. Um, the second part of the sizzle reel is ADA 31. And basically, during the pandemic, ADA Lead On Productions, we tapped some Lights Camera Access alumni, the career incubator, um, with talent with disabilities, both in front of and behind the camera, to remotely collaborate with artists and activists with disabilities to make this film highlighting non-apparent disabilities. Um, at the end of the ADA 31, you'll hear why we felt it was important to focus on non-apparent disabilities, and that's a conversation between comedian Nina G and Mean Dave. So everybody in this film you'll see has disabilities. ADA 30, Lead On presents Black Future Month, Legacy, Present, and Afrofuturism. Proud to present Blazing Fires chat room. I think for us, when we talk about uh, individuals with all abilities, with disabilities, there's, we still have work to do. Present, in conversation with Leroy Moore, founder of Crip Hop Nation. Yeah, I mean, Crip Hop has took it to the next level. You know, we've been around for 13, 14 years. Pro Futurism, in conversation with John Jennings, founder of Megascope. The society is disabled and people, people who don't have disabilities, they are, they are who they are. A graphic appears on a black screen. Tamika, discussion slash disability. Conversation slash culture. Tamika Sitchin Spruce, interview with Daryl Chill Mitchell. And then I got into a rap group called The Chaos. With Diana Elizabeth Jordan. You're anything I'm, I'm offered is a success. With Kia Brown. Excited for this conversation. Interview with Dr. Donna Walton. to be here today. Now, a text appears on a bright red background. Diana Elizabeth Jordan presents Andaline, Sherehe, Season 1, Episode 1. Eshe Jassi, Womanhood, 
Sheree Hay, Season 1, Episode 1. Hunter, don't waste my blood sweat. Sheree Hay, Season 1, Episode 1, at Def Louder, 2019. From all of us at ADA30 Lead On Productions presents Black Future Month, Legacy, Present, and Afrofuturism. Welcome to ADA31 Lead On. I got a blast. That's what I got for your nine year old It's a egg salad. Do Caesar what he can. Some kind of cross, they got a bear. What's my disability? That's right, folks. It's time to guess what's. Looks off camera, then down. Hey, I'm not a person with a non-apparent disability. So, take it away, Kuma. Nestled inside your safety skin, your beauty was always there. My name is Davey Hendrick, and I'm a mental health peer advocate. They used to be called invisible to, to disabilities. What's wrong with that? We're invisible enough. How about hidden disabilities? It's not like we're in the witness protection program. Undersung disabilities? Pseudo uh, abstruse? Or pre-perplexing under perspicuous differential disabilities? This is an hour-long show. I stutter and that's way too many P's and D's. Lead on logo. Two gold comedy and tragedy masks with red and blue accessible lip-readable PPE face masks show the smile of comedy and the frown of tragedy. All right. Thanks. And all these shows were done during the pandemic. We had a writer's Zoom. Usually you'd have a writer's room where people get together. Um, and we even had folks in India, Kumar, who uh, when Danny realized he didn't have a non-apparent disability and took off his toupee and threw it over to Kumar, who in actually India. is in India. So we had a global team putting that together. We'll continue to do more, so stay tuned for and 8832. Just uh, pre-pandemic, we had planned to do this at the, at the Kennedy Center. Yeah. Um, we had planned a big outdoor 8830 uh, event, um, but the pandemic led to us moving everything to this format. And as a result, we created this whole sort of new way to do these shows uh, that broadened our horizons, reached, you know, to people that maybe couldn't travel and reached internationally, as, as we mentioned. We have people from Canada and Italy and, and Mexico. So this, this has just really turned into something, somewhat of a blessing uh, during this, you know, this time. Yeah, and, and through the, the investors that we have, the sponsors that we have, you know, AT&T and Comcast, NBC Universal, and Paramount, uh, Viacom, CBS, Sony Pictures, Google, Meta, formerly Facebook, we're able to pay everybody. So while the myth is that you can't do productions and only 2% of all authentic representation in television, film, documentaries, theater are authentically cast of people with disabilities and only 1% of writers with disabilities, we just shattered that myth because this was 100% of people with disabilities, which is really very exciting. Um, and, and, you know, what we're not used to, too, is, is our community is used to doing these sort of advocacy events for free. So while this is an advocacy event on some level, it's also an entertainment event. And we paid everyone right down to a PA yeah. that, you know, was just doing some, uh, a couple of things online for us, but everyone got a check. And in a time when this community is last to be hired, first to be fired uh, during the pandemic, um, we felt this was one of the paramount aspects of what we were doing. Right, and now you have a great database to choose from when you go out that door and you start to include people with disabilities in your advertising and messaging and websites. So we wanna connect and that may not be your business unit that does the connection with your external ad agency or your marketing communications, but it's real important for the voice of disabled executives and employees inside the company because you work so hard and for decades on making sure and ensuring accessibility in universal design, both digital and architectural, whatever your sector is, to now make sure that gets communicated to marketing communications. They're not the experts on disability, you guys are. And 
you are their clients. You pay their check. So ultimately, it's what you want to portray. And it might sound silly, but don't give your power to an ad agency because uh, you really are the, the experts on disability and authenticity. Uh, and tap your disability employee resource groups as you've tapped them to develop recruiting and strategic alliances with the community and helping self-identification campaigns and bringing your whole self to work. Ask them to help frame the messaging for the ad agencies and the marketing companies because diversity is a business imperative, but inclusion is a choice. And by being here at CSUN this year, last year, next year, you've already proven that you have a commitment to inclusion. And the media has the power to shape attitudes, public policy, and actions or inactions. So you're really part of that change agent and force multiplier. And, and my belief is that uh, the rhetoric around any movement becomes policy, and then policy becomes law. Yeah. So as I've watched so many times, especially after the Oscar So White campaign, the rhetoric was exclusive of people with disability. And as a result, numerous policies and studios became, you know, became adopted that were exclusive of people with disability. And in fact, tax incentive laws that were made in the state of New York and in California now, where they got tax breaks for companies that utilize people uh, of color and women, uh, and even some in the LGBTQ community, were still exclusive of people with disability. And these became laws because of the rhetoric that was so prominent during that uh, 2016 period of time during the Oscar So White campaign. Right. And those of us in this room and those of you at home know that disability includes everything. It's open enrollment 25-7, and it includes every socioeconomic, religion, ethnic, gender, gender identification, everything. Disability crosses over all of them. So um, like Amazon did in documenting its inclusion policy right here uh, and its playbook, look at the, the, what you've done in terms of accessibility and those policies. And all we're asking to do is translate those so that externally people can know the great, great work that you're doing and you can be as inclusive as your intention inside the company. So per our talent database, we are creating a safe space for people to self-identify. We are a searchable database, searchable by region, skill set, and even disability. So if you're looking for somebody who is an authentic representation of someone from the deaf community, then you can search within that database. Right. And uh, this is going to create greater access to employment and resume building. For example, IMDB credit is given to every one of our performers and advocates that per appeared in this piece. So IMDB, the Internet Movie Database, is a big resource for companies to see, well, who's a professional? Right. And it's really where the industry goes to check out your credentials. Now, the entry to IMDB is pretty steep. Um, you have to have been in a production that's streamed or broadcast. It has to have been entered into a festival or exhibited in a theater. So because 80, 30 lead on productions are streamed, as Danny said, everybody who works on it, from the writers to the editors to the talent in front of, the PAs, the end credits that are done by Exceptional Minds who also do animation with Nickelodeon and Marvel, a uh, real great institute for youth with autism. Um, everybody's listed, everybody has their own IMDB page. So it's a really a great port of entry and launch pad for their careers, because we're really serious about this. We have, we imagine over a thousand talent in front of and behind the camera when we launch this database. And some of these folks are sag after members, so right. being in the union, they're not necessarily allowed to do certain things, even, even the streaming uh, piece like this. Um, however, we spoke to the union and said, we want to get waivers for our union performers because they're not getting out enough and they certainly can't do the non-union work. So we want to be able to make sure that they can do this job as well. And uh, this is our, our goal is to market this talent directly to the studios and ad agencies and, and other companies. 
And now we've reached the Q&A. So we're at the, we're near the end of our time here. It's at 8.50, so we want to ask you to. Uh, I said don't bring the gloves. You brought I the gloves. I know, I brought, take the gloves off. But so we That's have also, for it's big. A left, she, uh, <laughs> she doesn't play baseball. She's play putting baseball. In the left-handed glove on her right hand. Uh, I borrowed this and from what my is, husband. Is this one mine? Is yeah, this mine? <laughs> Is that the premise here? No, no, no. It was for big questions, big baseball mitt, and little questions. Here, we I can see. switch here. I'll take the little one. Okay. <laughs> so we won't bother singing the seventh inning stretch. Um, but this is a, still a tough crowd. You'd think after 51 minutes, you'd be warmed up. So questions? Answers? Yes. Uh, do we have a microphone in the house? Where's Phil Donahue when you need him? We can repeat your question. Come on up to the front. Or don't. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure whether the captioner caught that, but let me try and summarize. So the norms. Repeat the question. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to repeat the question. Oh. Uh, <laughs> this is where short term memory comes in. Um, the, the norm for racial representation, disability representation, takes a long time. What would we consider to be the norm, quote, normal of disability representation? Is that kind of the gist? I'm not seeing captioning, and that might help, but oh, here it is thinness and modeling. Yes, we're not done overviewing that. Thanks to Twiggy when I was growing up. Yeah, don't do the math. Go ahead. Right? Okay, so what is a journey like for conventional notions of what is beautiful? Is that capture what you want? It's a long journey. Uh, we're not, we're no place near there. Um, in, you know, the ADA is 30, will be 33 on July 26 this year. Uh, ten years before that, the Screen Actors Guild and the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, who negotiate all the contracts, had committed to include disability in the Affirmative Action and Non-Discrimination Clause to, quote, more accurately portray the American scene. So we are still not there yet. So Danny's right. Attitudes lead to policy, and that is exclusionary. But what we're starting to see through CODA um, and this is nothing new for anybody in this room or anybody watching at home, that there is a glorious deaf culture and deaf talent that now the industry is starting to wake up and see it's bankable. It's, we want to see that. Um, there were studies that uh, most people, even without disabilities, want to see authentic talent. R.J. Mitty talked about that, Danny, in, uh, in that report, that... Um, most people want to see authenticity in, in television and film. Right. In fact, there's, uh, there's more than $10 billion monthly that is revenue for the streaming services of streaming services that represent disability. And this is, not, this is not a question that was asked of the disabled. This is a question that was asked of the community at large. Do you want to see these programs? The answer overwhelmingly was yes. Would you... Uh, you know, choose a streaming service that showed these authentic representations of disability, overwhelmingly the answer was always yes. So then they looked at yeah. that and then they computed right. what the numbers are gonna be, and then they said, oh wait, this is something we, got, we have to be doing. And in answer to your beauty question, I, I follow a, on Instagram, like the kids do today, <laughs> um, disabled underscore fashion, and there's always these fantastic photos of, of people of different ages and different body types um, presenting themselves as beautiful. And I, I enjoy that quite a bit, and I would recommend, I, I have no you know, financial gain <laughs> from telling you to follow disabled <laughs> underscore fashion. Um, in fact, I, I'm not represented in there, so well, I don't know what that's about. Oh, sorry. But anyway. Uh, but also, you know, there's more vocalists. Um, there was uh, a lot of international protests around the film, maybe for you, a couple years ago, when it wasn't 
a horrible storyline. This rich guy acquires a spinal cord injury, and of course, he wants to kill himself. Um, not, a, not a new story, same thing as Million Dollar Baby, but the protests by disabled activists in the UK and Canada and here, the third weekend that the protests did not let up, Warner Brothers yanked the, theater, yanked the film from a thousand theaters. The fourth weekend, they yanked it from another thousand theaters. And when Brian Cranston did his role in The Upside, Danny met with him and came up with a really great, the wood burn ratio. Can you let people so know? So I, I, after the movie came out, there was a lot of backlash about Brian playing this wheelchair user uh, who is quadriplegic. So I have a relationship with Brian from years ago because he was Tim Watley, the dentist on Seinfeld. And I called him up and I said, hey, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of disheartened people about you know your portrayal of this character, and you know he said, well, publicity has been hand handling it, and I said, yeah, but it's not going to go away. It's going to continue to be talked about, and I'm right. wondering if you would mind meeting with me to discuss it. And so we sat down. I talked to him about how you know yes, he's a marquee name, absolutely, but our community is not going to get to that point if we continue to not be hired. And so people in, in the power position like himself need to help move that process along, especially when they take a role from another person with disability. And so I suggested to him, look, the next time you have this opportunity, something like this comes up or any production you work on where you see uh, someone who maybe has the credits or has the marquee name and can, can create box office is gonna play the role of a disabled character, you must hire three speaking roles as well of people with disability in that same project. So that's the, I came up with the, I was gonna call it the Woodburn Cranston ratio, but I said, no, Brian doesn't need his name on it. I'll just call it the Woodburn ratio. So it's three to one, three to one for every one that's taken, three are given. Right. And this, and this is how these folks will build a resume and right. build themselves to the, to the point of being a marquee name. So I think we have maybe one right now and it's Marley yeah. and, and you know Millie Sims and a, a couple others that are actually gonna be able to sell a film, but it's, it's very rare that we have that because our access to education, our access to opportunity is not the same. Yeah, and Ali Stroker won a, a Tony for Oklahoma which she had to accept backstage <coughs> because there was no ramp to the stage. But that was fixed last year at the Academy Awards for Crip Camp, and this year as well. Beautifully woven into the universal design of that stage. But that's, that gets back to lowered expectations. You never assume that anybody with a disability would win anything, right? And now Ali's, Ali's story is, is quite fascinating and unique as well because, you know, they built her a dressing room that was accessible at uh, Circle in the Square, and they built a stage that you know, worked beautifully for everyone, including Allie. Uh, it wasn't like, oh, that stage looks weird. It, 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 was, it was a perfectly done theater piece that was fully accessible for her. And she helped sort of shift the paradigm of the way people think about this process because now they have, they have spent not that much money on creating this accessible space for her. But now, here she brings them she brings them a Tony as a result. That's right. So what what is the what is the cost benefit analysis here? Yeah. You know. So that that show runs now way longer than probably it would have without her. Yeah. Runs and rolls. So we're at time, and we want to thank you so much for being here today and being in our studio, our home audience. Um, and you have the power. You've done, you've work very hard to create accessibility inside the companies and we're here to support you to push that message out to your ad agencies, your marketing communications and help you find the talent. And with one second, it's nine o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.